How's everybody doing? Hotep. Hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. So it is uh, Thursday, September 6, 2018. Okay. And we are live. Hope everybody's doing all right. Okay, so I wanted to uh, do this broadcast because uh, the uh, movie Black Panther is now on Netflix. Movie Black Panther is now on Netflix. It was a huge success, number one movie in the country for five weeks straight. It was released February 16th, 2018. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm a big fan of the film. I saw the movie twice. I've researched the 52 year history of the Black Panther comic book. I've done a number of lectures dealing with the film Black Panther. Okay. So, um, I'm going to talk about some of what you're going to see actually represented in the movie. Cause a lot of people don't understand the movie and they put their own interpretation upon it. Right. So to understand the film Black Panther, you have to understand uh, African history to really understand it, to really understand the film. You have to have some understanding of African history, African culture, spiritual systems, uh, African spiritual systems, uh, language, as well as um, you have to understand some of the history of the Black Panther comic book, okay? All right, so share this broadcast on your Facebook page. Invite your friends to tune in. And I do, um, you know, I do, I do radio here in Detroit on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation WFDF. We have people listening across the country. I've talked about the film Black Panther a number of times on the uh, on my show, and then also uh, I do lectures. So uh, I'm going to talk also about our um, our eight digital download Black Panther bundle pack as well. It, it was just, it just, uh, we just uploaded it today. And um, this, this includes three of my lectures dealing with the film Black Panther, okay? And it's all available on digital download at africanhistorynetwork.com. We just posted the link here. But um, I'm gonna show you this PowerPoint presentation, all right? So let me bring this up. So when I, when I do presentations, I was just in San Diego um, August 10th through, through the 12th at Return of the Gods, the Real Family Reunion. I did a presentation there entitled Lessons from the Film, Black Panther, uh, Economic Guerrilla Warfare, Political Self-Defense, and How to Wakanda the Vote. Um, and um, I've, done, I've done a presentation for children as well, but a lot of people don't really understand what they're seeing and they don't have enough understanding of African history to understand the film also okay so this is just a a brief overview of it all right and this is these slides here are from the actual presentation that i do called a black panther uh, a black panther analysis african culture history and afrofuturism it's about a three-hour presentation this is one of the presentations in the eight db in the eight digital download black panther bundle pack okay all right and you can watch these uh you can uh, when you order the digital download bundle pack you can watch from around the world the links are good for seven days you can download the videos and, the, and they're yours you can keep them. all right so anytime i do a presentation i know i'm going to say some things that people never heard before say some things people don't like say some things people disagree with all right so i usually say something like this the space inside this circle represents my realm of knowledge Everything that I think I know about whatever I think I know is represented within the circumference of this circle. I must keep in mind that there are still things to know that exist outside the circumference of my own awareness. Okay, so uh, just because you know everything that you know about what you know does not mean you know everything there is to know about what you know. There's still things that exist outside the circumference of your own awareness. All right, so hopefully everybody understands that and this is why research is important okay so in preparation for these lectures that i do on the film black panther i watched the, i went to go see the movie twice i paid for it right it wasn't bootleg 
I went to go see the movie uh, Black Panther twice in the theater. Uh, also, I, um, uh, I read over 100 articles dealing with the film Black Panther. Um, and then I, I researched uh, a lot of the history of the Black Panther comic book as well, okay? Um, basically the 52 year history of the Black Panther comic book. And um, for that, I read the, um, I also wrote two articles dealing with the film Black Panther. I've dealt with it a number of times on my radio show. I do a lot of research. So those that watch me here on the African History Network fan page or on my personal page, Michael and Hotel, you know I do a lot of research, all right? So this is the, uh, this is the book that I read from Marvel, which deals with the 52 year history of, um, of the Black Panther comic book, all right? And let me stop the share. Uh, let's see, so you can see this here, okay. So this is uh, Black Panther, the Ultimate Guide for Marvel. Black Panther, the Ultimate Guide for Marvel. This is uh, 196 pages, 198 pages. This deals with the 52 year history of the Black Panther comic book. This deals with storylines, themes, characters, all different types of things like that. Origins, all different types of things like that. For instance, this deals with the Dora Malaji and the origin of the Dora Malaji, things like this, right? So I, I, did a, I did a lot of research in preparation to be able to do my presentations, okay? This is background information on the Black Panther, T'Challa as the Black Panther and the history of the Black Panther going back to uh, the beginnings of the Black Panther, the protector of Wakanda, all right? So that's just a little, just a little background information, all right? Because I see a lot of people talking about the film and over the course of, you know, the last few months, I saw a lot of people talking about the film, things like this, and when I, when I ask them questions about it, I can tell they haven't done any research. All right, so to understand the uh to understand the film you have to have some background you have to have some background understanding of the black panther comic book right so the black panther character first appeared in uh marvel comics it was uh the fantastic four issue number 52 in july of 1966 this was the first appearance of a Black Panther character. The, the character of the Black Panther was created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, okay, for Marvel Comics, all right? So this was the first time we saw an African superhero, okay? This is the first time we saw an African superhero, especially one who was a king of an African nation. Now, this is taking place during the Civil Rights Movement, going into the Black Power Movement, Okay, it's 1966. This is, the, this is the year after Malcolm X was assassinated. Malcolm X was assassinated February 21st, uh, 1965, the Audubon Ballroom. Okay, this is the year after the Voting Rights Act was signed, August uh, 6th, August 6th, I think it was August of, uh, of um, 1965. Okay, this is uh, two years before Dr. King is assassinated. All right, so we're talking about 1966. So in this uh, issue 52, it was a two-part story, 50, issue 52 and 53. In this uh, issue of the Fantastic Four, the Black Panther defeats the Fantastic Four in their own comic book. The Black Panther defeat the Fantastic Four in their own comic book, this African superhero. We had never seen anything like this before. Now, there had been some African-American characters and comic books prior to this. They were minor characters, right? They were not a major character like this, okay? Uh, so at the end of issue 52, um, the Black Panther, T'Challa, takes off his mask. This was after his father, T'Chaka, who was the king of Wakanda, was killed. Um, and uh, he was killed by Ulysses, uh, Ulysses Claw. Okay, Ulysses Claw was the character in the film Black Panther we saw with the arm cannon that was made from vibranium. Okay, and T'Challa wants to go avenge his, his father's death. And T'Challa uses the Fantastic Four as a test 
to determine if his powers and his skills are good enough to go avenge his father's death and go after Ulysses Claw. So at the end of issue 52, uh, he says, um, he says, I am, you see me, hereditary chieftain of the Wakandas and, and perhaps the richest man in all the world. But it was not always so. My tale is one of tragedy and deadly revenge. Okay, then it goes, it continues the next month, issue 53, because this is how the comic books do, right? They always end on a cliffhanger to get you to go by the next issue, all right? So when we talk about the richest man in the world, and see, the film relates to African culture, it relates to African history, spiritual system, all of this. So in my presentations dealing with the film Black Panther, I tie all of this into it. Um, so when we, when we talk about the richest man in the history of the world, it just so happened to be an African man. That was Mansa Musa of the Mali Empire. He became emperor in 1312 AD, all right? Now, this information right here is from the History Channel, okay? The, the, uh, this is from history.com, which, which is the official website of the History Channel. This is what Europeans are saying about Mansa Musa. Now, this article came out after the film came out. The film officially debuted February 16, 2018, right? It's done $1.3 billion worldwide, uh, directed by Ryan Coogler and uh, directed by Ryan Coogler and co-written by Ryan Coogler and Joe Robert Cole. It was the two African-American men who wrote the script for this film, all right? Uh, so this article comes out March 19, 2018 from history.com, the official website of the History Channel. Here's an excerpt of what this article says. In the vast fictional universe of Marvel comics, T'Challa, better known as Black Panther, is not only king of Wakanda, he's also the richest superhero of them all. And although today's fight for the title of wealthiest person alive involves a tug of war between billionaire CEOs, the wealthiest person in history, Mansa Musa, has more in common with Marvel's first black superhero. Okay, so then it continues. It says Mansa Musa became ruler of the, of the Mali Empire. Mansa Musa became ruler of the Mali Empire in 1312 AD taking the throne um, taking the throne after his predecessor Abu Bakr II taking the throne after his predecessor Abu Bakr II uh, for whom he had served as deputy went missing on a voyage he took by sea to find the edge of the Atlantic Ocean now Mansa Musa's rule came at a time when European nations were struggling due to raging civil wars and a lack of resources. During that period, the Mali Empire flourished thanks to ample natural resources like gold and salt, okay? So that just right there, you can teach an entire, I can teach an entire class on that. That right there, here you have the history chat. So you have to understand how significant this is. So this is, so I heard a lot of criticisms about the film Black Panther. I heard them say, well, we don't need a fictional movie to teach us to teach us history. The movie relates to history. The movie is a bridge because it, what it did was it opened people's minds. So now you have a lot of African-Americans who want to learn African history, but they don't want to be preached to. They don't want to be denigrated and derided. OK, they want to be taught. So here you have the History Channel admitting to you that at a, at a time when West Africa was flourishing, Europe was in, uh, they had several civil wars. They were in disarray. This was during the dark ages. It's the Africans known as the Moors who go into Europe, go into the Iberian Peninsula, today known as Spain and Portugal in 711 AD. They're taking the teachers with them from Africa, especially ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, and they're bringing Europe out of the dark ages. But at this time, 14th century, 1312, Europe is still in the dark ages. There's still a lot of ignorance. There's still a lot of disease and things like this, even though it's, it's less than when the Moors first went in. This is what Europe is dealing with, okay? So here you have the History Channel telling you this. Read the full article. This is just an excerpt of the article. The 14th, this 14th century African emperor remains the richest person in history. This is from history.com, March 19th. 2018. Okay. So 
when we when we when we study this and we teach this to our children, and I, and I do a presentation on Black Panther for children. I did it at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, May 29th, 2018. And um, I was presenting to fifth through 12th graders. Okay, there's about 60 children there. And I tie in the African history, I tie in Pan-Africanism and Marcus Garvey. I deal with a lot of different things in there, okay? And then uh, once again, we have, um, we have our uh, bundle pack, our eight, our eight digital download Black Panther bundle pack. It just went on sale today. I just made it available today. Uh, you get eight of my presentations on digital download format, so you can download all around the world. Um, and it's on sale $50, regularly $80, and includes three of my lectures dealing with the film uh, Black Panther, okay? We'll post the link here. And uh, this is, um, I do PowerPoint presentations, you know, slideshows for the presentations. I have videos, video clips involved, things like that. So here is, uh, these are some of the slides from some of my presentations I'm showing. We just posted the link here on the thread of the broadcast. Is also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right. So um, you have to understand language as well. Now, the word Wakanda is not a made-up word. This is what I tell people. And when I travel across the country, you know, I talk to a lot of African-centered people and things like this when I do my presentations. People don't know this. The word Wakanda is not a, a made-up word. Um, Wakanda is a Native American term. A Native, Native American word, we see it in the Sioux Indian language, we see it in the Omaha Ponca language, okay? Uh, Wakanda is also um, in one of the Bantu languages, all right? And I'm trying to find the exact Bantu language, but I've done some research and, and I know enough to know that it's in the Bantu languages as well. Now, the word Kanda, K-A-N-D-A, Kanda is, is, is a key Congo language. Uh, sorry, Kanda is a key, Kanda is a key Congo word which is, is a Bantu language. And Kanda, the word Kanda means family. The word Kanda means family. The, and Kanda is part of the word Wakanda, all right? But very quickly, if we look at this, right? So we see uh, the word Wakanda in, amongst the, all the Omaha, the Ponca, and Osage Native American nations, Native American tribes. Basically, the word Wakanda means possesses secret powers possesses secret powers, okay? And there are a number of different sources I looked at. I just put together this snapshot here for you. All right, so uh, amongst the Osage Native American tribe, Wakanda uh, referred, to their, referred to God, the supreme being, okay? Wakanda is the great creator power of the Osage, Omaha, and Ponca tribes. Wakanda is an abstract, omnipresent creative force who is never personified in traditional Siouan legends amongst the Sioux Indians, and in fact, did not even have a gender before the introduction of English with this gender-specific noun. Now, you'll see a few different variations of the spelling of the word Wakanda. You may, you may, may see W-A-K-O-N-D-A or W-A-K-A-N-D-A as it appears in Black Panther, okay? Um, in Wisconsin, there is a Wakanda Water Park. It's spelled W-A-K-A-N-D-A. -A -A. There's a Wakanda Water Park in Wisconsin. It's been there for years, okay? Because uh, I went and researched that as well. In Omaha, Nebraska, you have a school named Wakanda. So there are different schools across the country named Wakanda. This is the Native American term. But it's also, uh, now the word Wakanda is also related to uh, uh, the word Wawanda, Uganda and Buganda. It's it's a a, a Bantu uh, word, and we understand if you if you understand a chronology of history, then you understand if you and if you read this book by um, a friend of mine, Dr. David M. Hotel, the first Americans were Africans, documented evidence. Then you'll understand that um, African people were here in this land we call the United States of America before Native Americans even came into existence, okay? Now, this does not mean that the transatlantic slave trade did not happen. No, yes, it did, okay? But, this, but African people were already here. You have different migrations at different periods of time, some voluntary, some forced, all right? But 
he's coming out with a second edition of this book. His book has 713 footnotes. Um, it's a deep book. It deals with thousands of years of history. But on page 14 of his book, um, he deals with a discovery from 2004 uh, made by Dr. Albert Goodyear, who's an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina. Okay. And um, this discovery, they found 13 different disciplines. They found uh, 13 different types of evidence fairly documenting an African presence in this country we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago. Okay. See, this is how, see, this is, this is what I'm trying to explain to people. To really understand the movie Black Panther, you have to understand African history, African culture, language, spiritual systems, and some of the history of the Black Panther comic book. Okay. So these are the types of things that I research. So when I do my when I do my presentations, and this is just a brief overview of about a three-hour presentation um, that I did on Black Panther, and I have two other ones. Uh, lessons from the film Black Panther, where I deal with what we can actually learn from the film and take and actually use. Lessons from the film Black Panther, economic guerrilla warfare, political self-defense, and how to Wakanda to vote. Then I have my Black Panther um, lecture I've done for children as well, okay? So most people don't know about the African presence in this country prior to Native Americans. Uh, but here's what they found. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints and lava, genetic M174, dehaploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics, linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeleton structures and tools. They found 13 different disciplines, 13 different types of evidence, barely documented an African presence in this country we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago. These were the Khoisan. The Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the planet. Okay, they come from southern Africa. All right, they uh, um, they they are the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. The Khoisan go all around the world. Okay, and they were here as well. Now, Asians come to this land uh, about three thousand BC, about five thousand years ago, and the Africans who are already here and the Asians intermix in their offspring of who we call Native Americans. When you look at old, um, when you look at old um, uh, photographs of Native Americans, these were usually a dark-skinned people, oftentimes with high cheekbones. All right, they're not the very light-skinned, almost white-looking Native Americans that you see today. Okay, so we have to understand this chronology of history. This does not mean the transatlantic slave trade did not happen. Yes, it did happen, but it happens thousands of years later. There were already Africans, African people here in this land. Okay, we 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 the different migrations, forced or voluntary, take place at different periods of time. So, so when I tell people, I say we can't just look at the last four hundred or five hundred years of history. We have to study the last at least fifty thousand years of history to really, to really understand this. And, and to better understand our history, because when our people find out that this was our land stolen from us, and we were here before Native Americans came into existence, we were definitely here before Europeans came here, but this was our land stolen from us, it changes your mentality. You don't think of yourself as being a guest in this land. This is why when African Americans talk about we need to separate, I say, okay. I say, well, last high, first fire, why should we be the ones to leave? This was our land stolen from us. We were here before Europeans got here. We were here before Jamestown, Virginia, 1607. We were here before Juan Ponce de Leon and the Spanish conquistadors came into Florida in 1513. He brought a, a person of African descent with him named Juan Garrido. But we were here before that, okay? We were here before uh, the, the, the before the Vikings were here, Leif, Leif Erikson and, you know, Eric the Red and all that, you know, about uh, 1000 AD. We were here before that. So why should we be the ones who leave? Okay, if you want to separate, all right, last high, first fire. We shouldn't be the ones who leave. Okay, it was, there were 2.3 billion acres of land stolen from African people and Native Americans, okay, prior to Europeans coming here. All right, so let's continue. So read the first Americans were Africans documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotel. 
Um, and when you register for the online courses that I teach, I did, I, we go much deeper into this type of history. Um, I have an online course that I teach called Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, okay? That's a 14 hour, seven session online course. So we get like deep into the history. That's in, that's in a bundle pack also. That's a, a 10 course online bundle pack at $60, regularly $130. That one you stream, you can watch as many times as you want to. The um, eight digital download Black Panther bundle pack, that is uh, digital downloads. You can download that, okay? And that's uh, that just became available today. That's $50, regularly $80. It includes three of my lectures dealing with the film Black Panther, including this presentation you'll see here. The, this, th these slides are from my, um, uh, three hour presentation I do on the film Black Panther called a Black Panther analysis, African culture, history, and Afrofuturism. Okay, and we, are, we have this also available at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, okay? So the film relates to African history, whether people realize it or not, okay? The film Black Panther relates to African history whether people realize it or not. You have to understand African history and understand the connection to be able to explain it to people, all right? So, very briefly here. Now, this is an article from sciencedaily.com, sciencedaily.com. This is from November 18th, 2004. This is about the archeological discovery that Dr. David M. Hotep references in his book, The First Americans Were Africans, documented evidence that I just showed you. This is Dr. Albert Goodyear, okay? He just happens to be a white man. He's an archeologist at the University of South Carolina. This article is about his discovery. This article is 14 years old. Most people, when I travel across the country and I do lectures, I talk to people about this, I show people this article, most of our people never heard anything about this. They can tell you what they can tell you what's going on with Cardi B and Offset, but they don't know anything about this. And this is 14 years old. So, the name of this article is "New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago." New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. Here's a synopsis of what the article says. This is not my synopsis. This is the synopsis from ScienceDaily.com, which is a scientific journal. Okay, they have all types of different scientific articles there. Radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains. Well, artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear, indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age, okay? This is, this is totally contradictory to what the standard uh, archeology span teaches, and they deal with the Clovis culture in New Mexico, which is about 13,000 to 15,000 years old, and they say those were, that, that was the first evidence of humans in, this, in, in North America. It's like, well, wait a second, you got evidence of Africans being here going back at least 51,700 years ago, before Native Americans come into existence. And, and something that Dr. David, because Dr. David M. Hotep is a friend of mine, and I, I've, um, I've interviewed him 11 times on my shows, on my show, The African History Network Show. You can uh, listen to the podcast of our shows at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, okay? Um, and, and, and one of the times, you know, one of our personal conversations and even in one of the interviews, he said that you're never going to find skeletal remains of Native Americans that are older than Homo sapiens sapiens, which is modern man, that's what we are, Homo sapiens sapiens, the, the species. And he said the reason why is, is because they didn't exist before that species. But with African people, you find this Australopithecus afarensis, which is what Lucy was, Dinknesh, Lucy, 3.2 million years old. You find all species of African people, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, you find Homo sapien, 
Homo sapiens sapien. You found all these because uh, because we were the beginning. But for Native Americans, you won't find any older than Homo sapiens sapien. This is what he told me, and this bears true to this day. Okay, but you have to be able to understand this history, understand this chronology of history. All right. So when we look at Bantu, Bantu languages. So what what is Bantu? So Bantu languages are a group of 500 languages belonging to the Bantoid subgroup of the Benue Congo branch of the Niger Niger uh, Niger Congo language family. Okay, so we see Bantu languages. Uh, we see them spoken uh, in uh, southern Cameroon. We see them. Uh, we see them in a very large area, including most of. Africa from southern Cameroon eastward to Kenya and southward to the southernmost tip of the continent, which includes South Africa. South Africa is the southernmost temp tip of the continent of Africa, right? 12 Bantu languages are spoken by more than 5 million people, including Rundi, Rwanda, Shona, Kosa, it's pronounced Kosa or Isi Kosa, I'm coming back to that in just a minute, and Zulu, okay? Swahili or Kiswahili, which is spoken by 5 million people as a mother tongue and some 30 million as a second language, is a Bantu lingua franca important in both commerce and literature. Kiswahili is a, is a Bantu language also. Now, in the film Black Panther, you see the scenes of T'Challa, Chadwick Boseman's character, talking to his father, T'Chaka. Okay, um, who is uh, played by John Kanai. The language they are speaking is Isi Kosa. It's a Bantu language. John Kanai is South African. John Kanai is from South Africa. He speaks, he speaks Isi Kosa. And, I, and I, I heard an interview that he was doing with a news outlet, and he said that they were on the set one day and they were speaking back and forth English. And he talked to Ryan Coogler, the director, and he said that they should incorporate an African language. Isi Kosa is the language that he speaks. That's how I got incorporated into the film. All right. So here is uh, the director of the film, Ryan Coogler, 31 years old at the time. Just a few years ago, Ryan Coogler was homeless, living in his, in his car. This is his, only his third film that he's directed. Uh, he directed uh, uh, Creed. Uh, and then uh, he also directed Fruit Ball Station, okay, about the uh, life and killing of Oscar Grant. Both of those movies starred Michael B. Jordan, who co-starred in this film. He played the part of Eric Kilmer, all right? All right, so we see, you know, these are some scenes from the film, things like this. This is the battle scene. Uh, this is at, so where, they, where the, where the uh, ritual combat takes place, okay? Is called Warrior Falls, F-A-L-L-S, Warrior Falls. And then uh, this is uh, straight out the comic book. This is Killmonger in the comic book. They changed Killmonger for the movie. A lot of people don't even understand Killmonger in the movie. Killmonger in the comic book was not half African-American. He was 100% Wakandan. They change it for the movie and make them half African-American to bring in another storyline, to bring in another part of history, to resonate more with a predominantly African-American, to resonate more with an African-American audience, those who are going to see the film, okay? Otherwise, you would just see a film that is just basically Wakandans. Now, Wakanda is made up of 18 different tribes. The, the people who live in Wakanda are not just one tribe. They're made up of 18 different tribes. And this is represented in the different uh, cultures that you saw in Wakanda and the way that they dressed, the way they wore their hair, okay? So when you saw the side of the mountain and you saw Warrior Falls, and let's go to some of the culture, being that I'm talking about the culture. Let's, uh, let's go to some of the culture here, okay? so. When you saw the side of the mountain during the warrior combat at Warrior Falls, you saw the different representations of the different tribes of Wakanda. The Jabari tribe led by Mbaku, that's one of the tribes that lives in Wakanda. Uh, 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 Mbaku was the leader of the, of the Jabari tribe. 
T'Challa is the leader of the Panther clan, the Panther cult, and he's also king of all of Wakanda, all right? So Ruth Carter was the costume designer for the film Black Panther, okay? She's been in the game 35 years. She was the costume designer on the movie Malcolm X. She said she did not know uh, much about the Marvel Universe, but she said, quote, I really wanted this movie. There's a big article that um, New York Times did on her, uh, the Afrofuturistic designs of Black Panther. So she studied African culture for six months and incorporated into the film. So in the film, you see about 11 different African cultures represented. We see the Basofo uh, from uh, Lesotho in South Africa, the, the, the quilts that the warriors who protect the border of Wakanda, the quilts that they're wearing were influenced by the quilts that the Basofo of the African country of Lesotho where Lesotho is an enclave of South Africa. Lesotho is an African country within the country of South Africa. Okay, here's a little background information the Basotho heritage blankets. Now, these blankets have a deep cultural significance and history. The world renowned Basotho tribal blankets distinguish this nation from others by the way in which the blankets are worn are worn as part of their everyday life. The designs have been developed over many years with the blessing of the Lesotho royal family, okay? For more information, check out aranda.co.za, R-A-N-D-A, aranda.co.za. In some of my presentations, I go deeper into this, right? But they, they have specific designs, uh, and this deals with, this deals with the, the Lesotho culture, okay? So this, so a lot of these things that you saw in the film Black Panther, these are not just, a lot of these things are not just made up. They're coming from different African cultures, okay? So the Wakanda script that, that we see, that's from the uh, Nsabidi from Nigeria, the Wakanda script, all right? And uh, in several scenes in the movie, uh, what the Wakandan text appears on the screen and is, and is and is inscribed on the walls in T'Challa's throne room. In reality, though, the script draws inspiration from Nsabidi uh, with origins in modern day, uh, uh, in modern day Cross River in Southeast Nigeria, okay? When we look at the neck rings that the Dora Malaji wear, so Dora Malaji means the adored ones, the adored ones, okay? And if we look at uh, this book here, this is one of my source books that I read to be able to do these types of presentations on the film Black Panther. This book deals with the 52-year history of the Black Panther comic book, Black Panther, The Ultimate Guide. This is for Marvel. Um, see, this is the Dora Malaji in the comic book, okay? They were introduced in 1998. Dora Malaji means the adored ones. Dora Malaji means the adored ones. And they are the personal bodyguards of uh, the king of Wakanda. They also protect Wakanda, but they are the personal bodyguards of the king of Wakanda, all right, who is uh, T'Challa. Okay, let's go back to sharing the screen here. Okay, so the neck rings that you saw them wearing, that comes from the Indabele of South Africa, all right? And General Okoya was the uh, she's the general of the Dormalaji, okay? So the Dormalaji, their neck rings are silver because she's the general, she's the head of them, her neck rings are gold, okay? But if we look at these neck rings, the gold rings worn around the necks of the Dormalaji come from the Indabele tribe of South Africa, known as in, uh, Mzila, I think that's how it's pronounced, Mzila, only married Indabele women may wear the rings, even though uh, they've become something of a fashion trend uh, in South Africa recently. Traditionally, husbands are supposed to provide the rings once they have built a home for their wives. The wealthier a husband is, the more rings a woman has, okay? So I, I deal with a number of different cultures that are, that, that are incorporated into the film. I'm just gonna 
highlight a few because this um i'm just this is just a overview of about a three-hour presentation i do and this this is one of the uh lectures that's in that eight uh that uh black panther eight digital download bundle pack from the african history network all the presentations about me michael m hotel founded the african history network hosted the african history network show it includes three of my uh lectures dealing with the film black panther uh it includes um the racist history of the white national anthem and the pledge of allegiance and some some other presentations also okay so that's available at africanhistorynetwork.com africanhistorynetwork.com then also we'll post the direct link right here on the thread of the broadcast uh also okay you can order that it's on sale fifty dollars regularly eighty dollars and you can download the uh you can download the videos and they're yours forever okay and you can download from around the world don't have to pay shipping fees or anything okay so when we saw the scene uh during the combat the the ritual combat for the throne of wakanda that took place at warrior falls okay also um the scene where t'challa is fighting uh killmonger um and killmonger throws t'challa over the waterfall that comes straight out of the comic book that's from september 1973 in an issue of jungle action jungle action was the comic book that um the series that Black Panther appeared in. That scene comes straight out of the comic book. That's from 1973, when, to, when Killmonger is fighting T'Challa for the throne of Wakanda, okay? And then, Kill, and then T'Challa is then going to come back uh, later and, and the battle continues and he's going to um, defeat uh, Killmonger. Killmonger ends up being killed during battle. In the movie, when you saw uh, T'Challa come back, he's healed by the African women. It's Nakia, um, who was his former fiance. Nakia uh, takes uh, some of the sacred herb, okay? And they turn it into a liquid and they have him drink it. This uh, causes him to regenerate, heal his wounds. He comes back to continue the ritual combat. When he, when he comes back, he tells, Eric Killmonger, he said, I did not yield. Therefore, the combat has to continue. The only way that the combat ends is if one person yields or, or gives up or somebody is killed, okay? So he said, I did not yield, okay? And Killmonger doesn't want to keep going. He's like, oh, forget that. And, you know, the Dormelagi are like, no, the combat has to continue. Okay, so we see this sister here, her style is influenced, her, the, the way her hair is designed, her style is influenced by the Ovahimba of Namibia, okay? And um, uh, she wears the distinctive locks of the Ovahimba, uh, and it's a type of paste that they put in their hair that um, gives a red uh, color to their hair also. And the paste is made of butter, uh, fat, and red okra and scented with herbal aromatics. Overhimba, the Overhimba plait or twist their hair uh, into thick locks, often leaving ends to puff, okay? Um, and living in the unforgi unforgiving desert climate of Northern Namibia, the Overhimba uh, also protect their skin with the red brown paste, okay? And here is the Overhimba sister, and you see how she's wearing her hair. We see this replicated. Now, this is not from the film Black Panther. This is an actual Ovahimba African woman. But we see these cultural influences from various African cultures represented in the film because there are 18 different tribes or cultures that make up Wakanda. Okay, just like in any African nation, it's not just one group of people. In Nigeria, you have the Yoruba, you have the Igbo, you have the Hausa, you know, you, so it's like this in various African nations. When we look at Angela Bassett's character, okay, so Angela Bassett played T'Challa's stepmother, Ramonda. That's not his birth mother. His birth mother died 
a few days after he was born and his father remarried. So this is his stepmother, okay? Um, and Angela Bassett just turned 60. That sister's fine. Oh my God, black don't crack. It just gets better with time. Um, but she wears a large disc headdress, okay? And that's called an Isicola. Uh, Isicolo, Isicolo. Uh, and that's from uh, the Zulu of South Africa, okay? And the Isicolo is a hat worn by married women and was traditionally shaped from grass fronds with cotton woven through. Uh, their sizes and colors differ between clans, at times reaching a meter in diameter. For Black Panther, Ruth Carter, who's the costume designer, that's a bad sister. She deserves Oscars and she deserves all the awards for, because all those costumes that you saw in Black Panther, that sister designed them. Okay? For Black Panther, Ruth Carter had Ramonda's dramatic white EC Cola 3D printed. They used a 3D printer to print that, to print her hat, according to an interview with Vanity Fair. Okay, here's another scene of her wearing her EC Cola. Okay? Then we see Maasai culture. Okay? We see the Maasai culture. So this brother here standing next to the sister with the, with the, with the hair coming from the Obahimba. His dress is influenced by Maasai culture, but also um, the Maasai culture influences the costumes of the Dora Malaji as well, okay? Now, the Dora Malaji are patterned after the Ahosi or the Mino uh, of uh, Dahomey, who were called the, uh, the Amazons, the Amazon warriors. These, these were um, a, a regiment of uh, African female warriors. Okay, amongst the 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 Dahomey, um, which is now in Benin, but the costumes of the Dormalaji is influenced by the Maasai of Kenya and Tanzania. So the Dormalaji, with their deep red armor and tall spears, looked like Maasai warriors, which was the look Ruth Carter, the costume designer, was going for. The Maasai shuka is instantly recognizable as the red and blue checkered, sometimes with black, yellow, or green, but red is always the base color. Uh, so it, it's, it's, uh, rec it, it's instantly recognizable as the red and blue checkered shawl draped over the semi-nomadic masa, okay? So this is African culture in, in, uh, that is uh, in the film that we see. And culture relates to history. Culture relates to spiritual systems. So this is a deep movie on multiple levels, okay? But you have to be able to understand African history and culture and language and spiritual systems and some of the history of the Black Panther comic book to understand this, all right? Okay, and then the Dormalaji Wakanda, uh, that's influenced by the uh, the homemade by, by the uh, Ahosi or the Mino from uh, uh, Dahomey, the African female warriors as well, who are known to decapitate their uh, opponents in battle, okay? And they were involved in the uh, um, the uh, Dahomey-Franco uh, wars, the, the wars against between the Dahomey and the French. All right, here's a, a picture of uh, the... African female warriors of Dahomey, known as the Ahosi or the Mino. Okay, they were known as our wives, or the king's wives, I should say, the king's wives. Um, all right, so this is just some of the background information, just some of the information from the film, uh, things like this, and some of the culture influenced, okay? And uh, this is just, uh, this is part of an overall three hour lecture. Uh, that I do on the film Black Panther. That's my big presentation. That's called um, A Black Panther Analysis African Culture, History, and Afrofuturism. Okay. And that's part of the um, Black Panther 8 Digital Download Bundle Pack. All right. That's available at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And we posted the link here on the thread of the broadcast also of, uh, of it. And that's on sale. Uh, $50 regularly, 100, sorry, $50 regularly, $80, okay? And you, you can um, 
order this, you can watch from around the world. You can actually download these as well. The, the links are good for seven days. You can download them once you download them, they're yours, all right? Okay, so when we saw Bast, when we saw the Panther deity called Bast in Wakanda, okay, that comes from Bastet. The Bastet is a uh, what's known as a netter or a uh, deity coming from ancient Kemet or what today we call Egypt. Kemet is one of the original names for Egypt meaning land of the blacks. And Bastet or Bast for short was an ancient Egyptian goddess worshiped in the form of a lioness and later a cat. So it had a female's body in the cat in the head of a black cat. Uh, Bastet was a deity or netter or goddess of warfare in lower Egypt or lower Kemet, worshiped as early as the second dynasty uh, around 2890 BCE before the common era or BC before uh, Christianity, okay? 2890 BC, all right? And we're going to see how the deities from ancient Kemet get, in, get reinterpreted amongst the Greeks and then get reinterpreted amongst the Romans. And then we, and then we see this infused into Christianity, okay? And we see this briefly here with uh, what happened. We see this briefly here with the uh, deity of uh, Dehuti, who the uh, Greeks called Thoth. And Dehuti was the one who, now this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Dehuti was the netter who delivered the Annunciation to the virgin Osset who the Greeks called Isis, that she was going to give birth, a virgin birth to the baby Heru, who the Greeks called Horus. And this story of this immaculate conception gets, gets told over and over and over again over thousands of years, adapted to various people's culture. But if you read um, Egypt, on, uh, not Egypt on the Potomac, that's another book by Tony Browder, Non-Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder, okay? And Browder's a friend of mine. I've interviewed Browder a number of times. Page 168. Some of you all have that book at home. Egypt on the Potomac. This is my copy. I need a new copy. It's beat up. I've had it over 20 years. Okay. They show you in this chart here on page 168, they show you how the deities from uh, ancient Kemet from the African spiritual system, get reinterpreted by the Greeks and reinterpreted by the Romans. <clears throat> okay, so briefly, it says here, I know it's hard to read, but briefly it says, Dehuti, the netter of science, writing, measurement, divine articulation of speech, and medicine, holds in his hand two staffs. So that's the one you see uh, to the, that, that's the one you see with the head of the ibis, the bird, okay, right here, Dehuti. All right, uh, that's number one. Um, one serpent wears the crown of Upper Kemet, Upper Egypt. The other wears the crown of Lower Kemet, Lower Egypt. Dehuti was referred to as Thoth, as Thoth, T-O-T-H, by the Greeks, okay? Now, amongst the Greeks, you're going to have, they reinterpret this deity and he becomes known as Hermes. When you study Freemasonry, and I deal with this in some of my presentations, you study Freemasonry, you, 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 you learn about Hermes Trismegistus, and it's Hermes who was said to write the, the books that the Masons use, it's like about 42 books, something like that. It's said that Hermes was the one who wrote these books. Okay, now, Hermes was the Greek equivalent of Dehuti. He is shown carrying a staff which has two entwined state snakes, okay? So we go from Dehuti carrying two staffs and each staff has a snake wrapped around it, okay? For a total of two snakes, we go from that to it being re to him being reinterpreted amongst the Greeks 
and Hermes carrying one staff with two snakes wrapped around it, okay? So, so pay attention. All right, so he is shown carrying a staff which has two entwined snakes. It was called the Staff of Hermes. In Greek mythology, he was associated with wisdom and the hermetic sciences were named in his honor, okay? So then we go to Mercury, and Mercury is among the Romans, okay? So, the, so you see how the ancient Kemites are going to influence all of this. This is African spirituality being reinterpreted. So Mercury is in the book, is an era he said is Greek, but Mercury is actually Roman. Mercury is the Roman version of Hermes and Dahuti. And he is similar in all aspects. The staff that Mercury carries is called the Caduceus. The Caduceus. And it has been adopted as the universal symbol of medicine. When you see the Caduceus from the uh, medical, uh, American Medical Association or American Dental Association, things like this, that comes straight out of ancient Kemet. This is a reinterpretation of what was in ancient Egypt. But we've been taught to hate Egypt largely through Christianity. But it's being taught, we were taught to hate that by people who don't really understand ancient Kemet. Okay? So when you see the caduceus, which is the symbol of the medical profession, you know where that came from. That's our stuff. All right. Let's continue here. Okay, so we talked about the Houthi and we talked about Thoth, right? Well, in Wakanda, there are different religions in Wakanda because you have 18 different tribes in Wakanda, like I said. Okay, so the religion of the Wakandan people first developed during, uh, uh, during the pilgrimage to the land and their conflict with the originators, and the originators were the, the, original, the ones who originally populated Wakanda. The gods of Wakanda formed from the heroes of humans within the tribe, ascending to the status of a god or deity. These heroes became the Orisha. Well, the Orisha come from the Yoruba of Nigeria. That the, the, that is the Orisha are the deities in the spiritual system of Ifa, I F A Ifa that's practiced among the Yoruba of Nigeria. When the Yoruba are taken into Africa, when it, during the transatlantic slave trade, when the Yoruba are taken into other lands, and they go into like Brazil, okay? They're going to create another religion, uh, like a, uh, what's known as a syncretic religion. It, it combines traditional African, African spiritual systems with Christianity, because Christianity was forced upon us. They're going to create something called Santeria. Santeria is a, com is a combination of Ifa and Catholicism, okay? And when they were worshiping and, and with the different saints that they were taught to worship by the Europeans, there were Orisha, African deities associated with them. So when it looked like they were worshiping an Afri a, a European saint, they were really worshiping an African deity. Okay, that's Santeria. All right, so, um, uh, so ascending to the status of a god, these heroes became the Orisha, taking the names Koku, Thoth, Thoth comes straight from ancient Kemet. Thoth was the Houthi. Thoth, Bast, which is Bastet, coming from ancient Egypt. Mujaji, Ptah, Ptah comes from ancient Kemet as well, and Niyami. The Orisha's origins date back to the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Egyptian beings known as the Ennead. The Ennead is a group of nine of the original deities coming out of ancient Kemet. This stuff comes straight out of the comic book. See, the, the, see, 
I'm trying to tell you, this movie is much deeper than people think it is. This movie relates to African history. This movie relates to African spiritual systems, African culture, language. This is a deep movie on multiple levels. This stuff comes straight out the Black Panther comic book. But, but, we, but we don't understand how deep this movie is. Okay? All right. Okay, so let's continue. This is just a brief overview here. So we see the Wakanda salute. We see people doing the Wakanda salute, Wakanda forever, right? It's right over left. It's not left over right. It's right over left. It's not left over right. Why is that? Okay? And we see this sister here, Sachia uh, uh, Victory, who is a, a women's tennis pro, uh, African-American. She's doing the Wakanda salute. We see, uh, we saw Maxine Waters at the funeral, the home going service for Aretha Franklin doing the Wakanda salute. Articles are written about it. Well, where does this come from? Where does this come from? We see the Wakanda forever greeting becoming normal celebration sign for black athletes. This is from March 13, 2018 from AtlantaBlackStar.com. We see tennis players and soccer players doing it. Well, where does this come from? Okay, this comes this come straight out of ancient Kemet. This comes straight out of ancient Kemet from the Nisu Biti. This is why it's, it's right over left and is not, is never left over right. Because the Nisu Biti are who the Asians call pharaohs. We didn't call them pharaohs. It was Nisu Biti, okay? You'll see some different spellings of it, but one of the most popular ones is N-S-W uh, B-I-T-Y. Nisu Biti, I think that's how it's spelled. Um, so it's a symbol. It, so when you see them with the arms crossed, it was a symbol of royalty and it was a symbol that they were deceased. Okay. And I talked to Professor Kaba Kamene about this also. But even on uh, MSNBC on M and NBC, they did a one hour special dealing with the film Black Panther. And in that, they talk about how the Wakanda salute comes out of ancient Egypt. Okay. And when you see Asar up here at the top in the middle, he has his arms crossed, okay? He's carrying the crook and the flail. You see down here at the bottom right, you see this comes out of ancient Kemet, and then he's holding the ankh, okay? The ankh is the African symbol of life, the African key of, uh, African symbol of eternal life, the African key of life. But this goes around the world because African people have been around the world. That comes straight out of ancient Kemet. The film ties you to African history, African culture, spiritual systems, language, all of this. This is a deep movie. It's more than just a movie. Okay, just because a movie is, is, is fictitious does not mean you can't learn something from it. Does not mean it does not have um, influences from reality and history and culture, things like this. Okay, but I heard people putting down the movie. I heard people saying, oh, we don't need a fictitious movie to teach us our history. Obviously you do, because most of our people don't know our history. I travel around the country. Most African-Americans can't tell you when the Civil War was fought why the Civil War was fought, okay? Most African-Americans don't know the U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3, does not say we were three-fifths of a human being. That's a total misinterpret misinterpretation and misunderstanding of the three-fifths compromise of 1787. Most of our people do not understand their history. I was just speaking in San Diego in August, Return of the Gods. I did a presentation dealing with the film Black Panther there, lessons from the film Black Panther. The month before that, I was speaking at the uh, Black Homeschooling Conference in Atlanta, because I'm there the third weekend in Atlanta each year. That's the Liberated Minds Black Homeschooling Education Expo. I did a presentation there on Black Panther. Most of our people don't understand our history. Okay, and this is how these games can be keep playing being played on us. We don't, most of us think we first came here August 20th, 1619. So next year, August 20th, 1619, they're going to celebrate, to commemorate the 400th year anniversary of Africans first coming to these shores. No, we, that did happen, Jamestown, Virginia. We were here for tens of thousands of years before that. This was our land stolen from us. But our history and culture has been stolen. We have to take it back and we have to take our minds back. Bantu Stephen Biko one of our great South African freedom fighters, he said the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. The most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. In the movie, I think it was the movie Cry Freedom, uh, Stephen Biko was portrayed by Denzel Washington, okay? I think, I think that was Cry Freedom. 
he was in. But uh, uh, Denzel Washington portrayed Stephen Biko, and I think that was uh, I think that was Cry Freedom. Uh, I think that was the name of that film. Okay. Um, let me see if I can try to verify that. I think that was Cry Freedom. Okay, but we have to take our minds back and we have to take it back quickly and unapologetically. Okay, uh, what was that? I think Denzel played one of them here. Let's see, Cry of Freedom, 1987, directed by British. Yeah, Denzel Washington, yeah, okay. I thought I was, I just hadn't verified that yet. I like to go look this stuff up when I'm broadcasting stuff. Yeah, 1987, Cry of Freedom. Okay, he played Stephen Biko. All right, so being as Den Denzel was in the movie, maybe maybe that'll cause us to go on and do some research on it. Okay. <laughs> being that Denzel was in the movie. <laughs> All right, so uh let's continue here a little bit longer okay uh, let's go to some of your comments here how's everybody doing uh let's flip back over here to facebook all right how's everybody doing hey this is michael m hotel founder of the african history network host of the african history network show i'm a talk show host researcher lecture and writer so the film black panther is uh on um netflix now it just became available on netflix uh tuesday and we're dealing with some of the background information and some of the history of what you're going to see in the film. And also, I was letting you know about our new eight, uh, our new Black Panther uh, eight digital download bundle pack that just became available today. <clears throat> it includes eight of my lectures, eight of my presentations, including three of my presentations dealing with the film Black Panther. Okay, this is on digital download. Uh, we just posted the link again here. Is also available at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can order from around the world, watch from around the world, and you can download these videos also from around the world, okay? So the bundle pack includes, let me tell you the eight uh, presentations the bundle pack includes. It includes, uh, the slides I'm showing you, this is from some of my Black Panther lectures. This presentation is called a Black Panther Analysis, African Culture, History, and Afrofuturism. It's about a, a three-hour presentation. So you get that one, you get lessons from the film Black Panther, economic guerrilla warfare, political self-defense, and how to Wakanda the vote, okay? And that deals with how we take the enthusiasm from the film and what we see in the film. We see, uh, 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 we see African people controlling the African nation, controlling the natural resources, the technology, they have an economy system, they have a political system, okay? How do we take what we see in the film and actually use it to help improve our conditions. And I show you specific examples of African Americans around the country doing these things that I'm talking about. So I'm not dealing with theory. Okay, and then also you get the presentation idea for children, the Black Panther analysis, African culture, history uh, for children. Uh, you get the light of ancient Egypt awakens the African mind to economic empowerment. I deal with the relationship between ancient Kemet ancient Egypt, the Moors, and um, taking this knowledge into Europe, and then also economic empowerment. Um, human guinea pigs, the history of the Tuskegee experiment of the Negro, on the Negro male, okay? And this deals with the history of the Tuskegee experiment of untreated syphilis on the Negro male that uh, was originally supposed to last six to nine months, but ended up lasting uh, 40, uh, 30 years is from uh, 40 years, 40 years. It was um, from 19, about 1933 to 1973, okay? And there's a lot of myths about it. First of all, contrary to popular belief, all the men in the study did not have syphilis. There were 600 African-American men in the study. Um, um, 399 of them had uh, an early form of syphilis. 201 of them did not have syphilis at all. That was the control group. Anytime you do a scientific experiment, you have two groups. You have one group that the stimulus 
is done too. You have another group that's untouched called the control, control group. There's a lot of misinformation dealing with the Tuskegee experiment of untreated syphilis uh, of the Negro male. And another myth is that they injected the men with syphilis. That's not true. The men already had syphilis. They did not inject them with syphilis. I'm not saying the study was not a horrific study. I'm saying we need to deal with factual historical information. So that's what I do in that presentation. The sixth presentation you'll get from me is Malcolm X 50 years later, why is he still relevant? Malcolm X 50 years later, why is he still relevant? So I deal with Malcolm's history, a lot of little known information of, of, about Malcolm. I deal with his influence on conscious hip hop because he was, I mean, he had big influence on conscious hip hop. Um, so that was, um, that's a good presentation of Malcolm X. Next you'll get, now this is something very relevant. All this stuff is relevant to what's going on right now. This next presentation is really relevant to what's going on right now. African-American resistance in the era of Donald Trump, voter suppression, reparations, and how elections have consequences. I did this, now this version of the presentation, um, I did November 24th, 2017, here in Detroit for the Hood Research Group. And in this presentation, I deal with three main themes. I deal with, um, one, similarities between Donald Trump becoming president and Richard Nixon becoming president in 1968. And we know Nixon was forced to resign from office. He announced his resignation August 8, 1974. He became the first sitting president to resign from office. So I deal with, see, Nixon was a backlash to the Black Power Movement, the Civil Rights Movement, uh, the, the Voting Rights Act of 65, the Civil Rights Act of 64, Affirmative Action of 65. Nixon was a backlash to the rebellions that were taking place across the country. There were 159 violent uprisings in 1967 alone, uh, but you had all these rebellions taking place. Nixon ran on the platform of law and order. He was a backlash to all of that. And law and order basically means protect white people and lock up African Americans. Then June 17th, 1971, Richard Nixon declared his war on drugs, okay? So you got to understand this history to understand what's going on today, to then understand. And all this came out of public policy. All this was laws. All these were policies written to laws by politicians. So we have to understand this to understand the laws that need to be implemented to address these issues that were created by policy, created by laws. Okay, this stuff didn't just fall out of the sky. You have to understand how a sequence of historical events lead up to larger events taking place. So then I deal with Richard, uh, I deal with Donald Trump and how Donald Trump partly ran on the platform of law and order, which is a throwback to Richard Nixon. Trump was a backlash to two terms of President Barack Obama, first African-American president, because John Hansen was not a black president. John Hansen was the senator of Liberia. Okay, there were two John Hansons. You got research that I've done presentations, written articles on that. There were two John Hansons. There was the white senator from Maryland who was president of the Continental Congress from 1781 to 1782, and he dies in 1783. Then you had a black John Hanson who was a senator of Liberia, and you see the photograph of him. That photograph was from around circa, this circa about 1852, if I remember correctly on that photograph of him, which is on the Library of Congress's website, I know, because I've been to the Library of Congress website and I've seen it there, okay? Um, so he was a backlash to two terms of President Barack Obama, backlash to Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the attempt to hold police accountable. He, um, Trump was a backlash to all of that stuff, okay? Um, and then I'll also deal with the rapid voter suppression that took place during the 2016 election cycle that we still don't understand. We still don't understand what happened. Um, and then I also deal with uh, how Trump is systematically reversing policies that President, Ob President Obama had in place. Many of these policies were beneficial to African Americans. We don't know this because a lot of us don't do research and we don't know that these policies exist. Okay. So that's what I did within that presentation, African-American resistance in the era of Donald Trump, voter suppression, reparations, and high elections are consequences. And then the eighth presentation that you get in this eight digital DVD bundle pack, this is all digital downloads. So people are speakers, a lot of people have been asking me, look, put your presentation on digital download. I don't have a DVD player anymore, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so here it is, right here. It's a, <laughs> it's a bundle pack. You can order from around the world, stream it from around the world, and download it from around the world. The racist history of the white national anthem and the Pledge of Allegiance. 
okay? And this ties into what's going on right now, the protests against Colin Kaepernick, the protests against the NFL players kneeling. I deal with the history of the national anthem. Why it was written by Francis Scott Key, a white supremacist slave owner who thought that African people were mentally inferior. I deal with the history of the Pledge of Allegiance. Then I tie all that history into the history of Colin Kaepernick's protests. Because you got to understand history to really understand Colin Kaepernick's protests, okay? So that is uh, available right now. That's on sale, fifty dollars. Regularly, eighty dollars. It's a eight. It's a eight. Uh, the Black Panther eight digital download bundle pack. All right. Presentation is done by myself, Michael, and Hotel. Uh, we just posted the link again here, and it's also at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right, Renee Lamar said, "Bingo, that's the one I want." Okay, now what? What are you talking about, Renee? Let's go to some of your comments, Willie. Uh, Willie Clance Holman said, hello from West Memphis. All right, doing excellent. Okay, how you all like this type of information? How you all like this type of information? Okay. Um, uh, Malcolm did, did more than talk about overcoming. You really should study Do um, Dr. King. <clears throat> Myron, I can tell by what you're saying, you, you have not studied Dr. King. And I can tell you never read any of his books. How many books did Dr. King write, Myron? You should read his last one, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? Nettie said exactly. Uh, Renee, uh, is the Pledge of Allegiance in this packet? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the racist history uh, of the white national anthem in the Pledge of Allegiance. I call it the white national anthem because that's what it is. There's no disrespect to anybody, but it's written by white people, for white people, about white people, signed in the law by white people, 1913. Uh, no, 1931. Congress signed. Congress. It, it 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 became the national anthem in 1931. The previous 40 times that bill was voted on in Congress, it failed. Okay, so it's been a national anthem less than 100 years. All right. So it, it and and uh, we knew it was the white national anthem. That's why James Weldon Johnson wrote the wrote the poem that became the black national anthem, lift every voice and sing, because we knew the white national anthem was not for us. This is why I call it what it is. I call it the white national anthem. All right, uh, LaWanda Roundtree said, okay, LaWanda's watching. Also, African-American business owners, hey, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast, um, and you can advertise with the African History Network on the podcast of our radio shows. We reach thousands of people across the country on a weekly basis, I host the African History Network show. And uh, you can email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have a special promotion. Get 50% off your first month, okay? So African American, we post the, post the information here. Uh, African American business owners, post the name of your business here on the thread of the broadcast. We had to tell you that earlier. Um, do, 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 do. All right. So Jonathan, uh, he says, so we can truly say Wakanda is real. Yeah, Wakanda is, is for Wakanda is a fictitious place, but Wakanda is uh, a real word. It's not made up. And you know, um, Jack Kirby and and um, Stanley, they had to have some type of knowledge. Wakanda is not just something you pull out of the sky. Okay, they had to have some type of knowledge uh, about this. All right, and the. Uh, Black Panther comic book ties right into the history of the Black Panther character. I deal with this in some of my presentations. The, the, the Black Panther character deals, ties right into the uh, Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. So the character comes out in July 1966. This is uh, a few months before the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense is, is, is formed uh, October 16, 1966 in Oakland, California by um, Bobby Seale and Huey P. Newton. Now, they get the Black Panther symbol from the Lowndes County Freedom Organization, founded in 1965 in Lowndes County, Alabama, by Stokely Carmichael, who became Kwame Ture. And they get permission from uh, the Lowndes County Freedom Organization to use the Black Panther symbol, because, see, every political party has a symbol, right? So they got permission to use that Black Panther symbol for the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, which was a political party as well. All right. So we don't have to negatively talk about the film Black Panther to say, oh, you should talk about the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. 
they, they, you can, you can teach about both of them. Okay. But some people just need something to complain about. All right. Um, and I understand that. Yeah. I understand people don't do research like this. Some people just need something to complain about. Okay. Gregory said, yes, wake up from your sleep, water, milk, then wine, take your time. Uh, I'm not sure what Greg is talking about, but okay. Wake up from the sleep. That's extremely important. Kelly Johnson's in uh, Houston, Texas. Um, let's see here. Okay, some people just need to want to be here and complain, so I get rid of trolls. I've got trolls in different area codes. Okay, look, uh, look. Lakunt Ra L. Big facts take back the mind. Yeah, we have to take our minds back. And we don't ask permission to take our minds back either, okay? What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself, okay? All right, so this is why I've been studying media for 26 years. This is why uh, media and understanding media is so important. What you, what you read, see, and hear affects the way you think, feel, act, and behave. We have Melissa, Sankofa Life in Georgia. Now, what's Sankofa Life, okay? Post the name, post, post the name of your African-American on business. If you can, post the website also, okay? Now, what's Sankofa Life? Because that sounds like you should be advertising with the African History Network, uh, Melissa. And if you are an African-American book author, you probably want to advertise with us. If you own a bookstore, uh, either e-commerce or physical store, if you um, sell, uh, if you have a clothing store, regular clothing, uh, Western garments, African garments, things like this. If you have an event coming up, whether it's a festival, whether it's a, a book author event, whether you're bringing in an African-centered scholar like Professor Kaba Kamene, or Dr. Lennon Jeffries, Professor James Small, um, you should probably advertise with the African History Network. Email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, okay? And um, we put your, you know, um, we put your 30-second and 60-second commercial to the audio podcast of our radio shows. We're on six different podcast platforms. If you don't have a commercial, I can record one for you. Just send me a script. We're on uh, CastBox, iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, Acast, FM Player, TuneIn.com. Those are the ones I know of, okay? Uh, on Blog Talk, um, between, in, within the first two weeks that the podcast is uploaded, it usually gets between 4,000 to 8,000 listens. Okay, Melissa, African Shop, okay? Sankofa Life. I figured Sankofa Life is an African shop, Melissa. What type of African? What do you say? What do you What do you have there? Sankofa. I know the fetch the fetch back. You know, I, I understand the Sankofa bird artist. I understand that. <laughs> what do you What do you sell there? All right. Lawanda said, "Thank you, my blessed King friend. We all need to hear all that you're saying. Uh, clothes, books, African art." Natural products. Okay, so you should email us, uh, <laughs> Melissa, because you should definitely you should definitely be advertising with the African History Network. And uh, the first month is fifty percent off. Okay, all right, all right. So um, that's just a brief overview of some of the things I deal with in our presentations, dealing with the film Black Panthers. A lot more. Um, I'm gonna go ahead. We're gonna go ahead and. Um, get out of here. Hey, I'll be in Philadelphia. Uh, those in Philadelphia, I'll be in Philadelphia uh, September 27th through the 30th at the All Black National Convention, the All Black National Convention that Dr. Boyce Watkins does. Um, I'm, I'll be one of the panelists, uh, panel discussion dealing with why we must buy black. And then also uh, I'll be a vendor there as well. Go to allblacknationalconvention.com allblacknationalconvention.com for more information and the, and the register. It's a fantastic event that works out. Dr. Claude Anderson will be there this year. He's speaking. Kenny Gamble of Gamble and Huff, legendary uh, songwriter, will be there as well. So it's, fa it's fantastic, the All Black National Convention. I'll be there. Uh, how you doing, Ellis? 
Um, and um, if you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization, uh, contact me through our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, um, and we can uh, make it happen. Okay, I know Kwanzaa is coming up. I have a fantastic presentation dealing with Kwanzaa. Um, in the history of Kwanzaa and also the African cultural celebrations that Kwanzaa is based upon also, all right? And then listen to the African History Network show Sundays, uh, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation. And then we have the shows archived and podcasted at africanhistorynetwork.com and we put your uh, commercial into the podcast. And then also some of the Facebook live broadcasts I do throughout the week, I put those in audio podcast forms We put commercials in those as well, okay? So look, hey, we have to get out of here. Hey, remember at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it corrects wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself, what you think about yourself is based upon what you've been taught about yourself, what you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself, okay? And then uh, lastly, let's see, I'll show you this. There's a lot of people don't know that Ryan Coogler put this into the film. This is a reference to the Pan-African flag. I have a video where Ryan Coogler talks about this. The color scheme that they're wearing, this is in the scene from Hong Kong, the casino in Hong Kong. Uh, Nakia is wearing green, uh, T'Challa is wearing black, Okoya is wearing red. And this is a reference to the Pan-African flag, the red, the black, and the green uh, that was adopted by the Universal Negro Improvement Association, the UNIA, uh, August 13th, 1920. And we know the UNIA was founded by Marcus Garvey in 1914 in Jamaica. And he comes to the US in 1916 and starts setting up chapters. So when I, uh, I talk about this also, and when I present to children, I talk about this and then teach them about Marcus Garvey. Because when I was teaching to the students in um, Detroit, most of them did not know about Marcus Garvey. Now, they knew about George Washington, the white supremacist slave owner, but most of them didn't know about Marcus Garvey, okay? And Garvey influenced the Honorable Elijah Muhammad because Elijah Muhammad was a member of the UNIA. Uh, Garvey influenced Malcolm X because Malcolm X, growing up, his parents were Garveyites, okay? So Malcolm is, is growing up hearing about black pride and hearing about our, our accomplish, accomplishments and things like this. And we also know that Garvey influenced Dr. King as well. So Garvey uh, influenced a lot of people. Garvey was influenced by um, um, uh, Booker T. Washington. That was one of his influences, Booker T. Washington. Garvey read Up, Up From Slavery, uh, the book Bush, Booker T. Washington wrote. Booker T. Washington was a former slave. He liked uh, Booker T. Washington's uh, self-reliance, do for self, um, uh, the economic empowerment preached by Booker T. Washington, and he was inspired by that. Okay, so we have to we have to understand this history. If people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. If people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. All right. So um, with that. We'll get out of here. Remember, right now, let's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you next time. Peace. Visit AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Peace.